Thank you and welcome to my presentation. My name is Susanne van het Hof de Goede and I'm here to talk to you about criminal persuasion techniques and the sharing of personal information by internet users. I uh, wrote this uh, paper together with Rick van der Kleij, Steve van der Weijer and Rutger Leukveld. Uh, if everything is going well, you'll see my uh, PowerPoint presentation and I'll just skip to the next slide now. So um, the reason that we're doing this research is of course the high online victimization of online crime and the huge impact this victimization can have on its victims. Um, while other researchers might have taken a technical approach, we'll, we'll be looking at the human factor in cybersecurity here, focusing specifically on internet users and human behavior. So previous studies have focused on cybercrime victims and they have tried to uncover who these victims are. They've looked at personal characteristics such as age, uh, occupation, marital status, and routine activities such as whether someone does online banking or has a social media account. And they've tried to see if any of these characteristics or activities are related to online victimization. And broadly speaking, um, none of these seem to be directly related to victimization. So what we wanted to do is take a different approach and look at actual behavior. And the idea here is that uh, unsafe online behavior increases the odds of becoming a victim of an online crime. Um, mm. And we wanted to see what, um, sorry, uh, what uh, people, how people behave online. Um, but uh, unfortunately, if you want to see how people behave and you ask them what they do online, uh, what they say they do online isn't actually the same thing as what they do online. Um, nor is if you actually get to tell them the truth, um, what they think they do online isn't necessarily what they actually do online. Well, researchers have tried to solve this problem by doing experiments. And while you do get to see how people actually behave online in these types of uh, settings, uh, very few explanatory factors are included. So in the end, you do know how people behave, but you're still unsure why they behave that way. So what we've uh, done in our online behavior and victimization study is we developed an instrument that measures how people actually behave online and also uh, measures uh, many possible explanatory factors. We've done this using a population-based survey experiment, uh, which is a de design that is basically a combination of doing a survey, an online survey, uh, with experiments included. Uh, and here you get the advantages of both. So you see a large representative sample filling out the survey, but you also get objective measurements and can include experiments. The sample that we've come up with for this online survey is uh, roughly two and a half thousand Dutch internet users. And this sample is representative for the Dutch uh, society uh, for gender, employment, and region of origin. Um, however, I do have to note that they're uh, more often highly educated and they're a bit younger than average. So the research question that I want to discuss today uh, is to what extent do Dutch internet users share personal information online? And is this related to persuasion techniques that criminals may use? So when we're talking about criminal persuasion techniques, I'm referring to the six principles of influence uh, by Cialdini. Um, and although he wrote about six, uh, we're focusing on two of them, namely authority and reciprocity. Mm -hmm. uh, authority basically means that um, criminals might uh, try to um, conv uh, convince online uh, users to behave in a certain way um, by uh, pretending they're from an authoritative uh, uh, institution or they're an authoritative figure um, and thereby, for example, by pretending to be a bank, they uh, try to get internet users to behave in a certain way. For example, click on a link or fill in personal information. 
And the second um, persuasion technique is, that we focus on is reciprocity, in which criminals might offer internet users some, something, um, and then in exchange they expect certain behavior. So that means that uh, they might offer something for free, or they might offer a discount um, if, for example, internet users fill out certain questions. So what we've done is uh, we've uh, asked uh, uh, respondents to fill out certain questions, thereby uh, measuring whether they're uh, um, likely to share personal information. So we did this at the end of the survey uh, when uh, uh, normally you would expect some rounding up questions, some final questions, basically age, uh, occupation, marital status. Uh, but what we did um, is increase the privacy value of these personal questions. So then we gave them some questions saying, what's your full name, what's your email address, what's your date of birth? Um, and then the most personal question that we ended with is, uh, what are the last three digits of your bank account? Um, I do have to note that we didn't actually record the answers that people gave due to privacy issues, of course. Um, so we only know whether or not they answered them or if they uh, decided to click on I'd rather not say. So the, in the experiment, what we did is for these two and a half thousand roughly uh, respondents, uh, one third uh, wasn't giving a persuasion technique. So we just asked them, please fill out these questions. Um, then about a third, we used a authority uh, persuasion technique saying uh, the researchers urge you to answer these questions. It's really important for the study that you fill all of these questions uh, out completely. And then the other third of the respondents, um, we offered them a chance of winning a gift certificate if they would fully answer all the questions. So then for the results, we also asked them to self-report uh, their behavior and we asked them whether or not they're inclined to share personal information like their email address through social media. Uh, this was done on a scale of one to five, one meaning that they uh, always share this type of information and five meaning that they would never share this type of information. Um, and on average, they scored uh, roughly four and a half, meaning that um, our respondents um, they indicate that they're very likely to behave safely uh, by not sharing their personal information. However, when we come to the objective measurements of sharing personal information, we see that many respondents were willing to share information that we as researchers had no uh, entitlement to. So, for example, they shared their full name, 31%, email address, date of birth, zip code, house number 20%. Um, and what's also interesting is that respondents seem to differ uh, uh, in the first place between their own personal information and personal information of another person because only 1% was inclined to uh, share an email address of a friend. So they seem to differentiate there. And also, while uh, all the other, uh, other percentages are 20% or higher, only 5% was willing to share the last three digits of their bank account, indicating that they do differentiate between sharing one type of personal information and another type of personal information. Uh, and while 5% might seem low in comparison, um, this means that uh, in the Netherlands and internationally, there might be millions of people uh, actually willing to share the last three digits of their bank account. And criminals, of course, can then use this to commit, uh, for example, spear phishing attack and all the other uh, information can be used for fraud or applying for a fraudulent credit card. Um, so this is a very interesting result in our opinion. Then when we focus on the experiment, we compared the group that received no persuasion technique with a group that re uh, received the authority persuasion technique, and we didn't see a significant difference in uh, the amount of personal val uh, information shared. Uh, for reciprocity, however, we did find a difference in the sense that uh, respondents seemed more uh, willing to share their personal information if we promised them a, a gift certificate or a chance of winning a gift certificate. 
So in conclusion, uh, this, this study, the online uh, behavior and victimization study focuses on explaining actual online behavior and victimization. And uh, this, these results indicate that um, there may be people that are um, have a weakness for persuasion and that criminals could benefit from this. And that means that there might be a possibility for interventions here. So uh, hopefully future research will uh, try to investigate if there uh, is a possibility for an intervention. Then uh, concerning the population survey experiment, population-based survey experiment, uh, we see that uh, there are certain downsides that have to be taken into account. For example, that uh, people fill out this survey at home, so uh, the researchers have less insight into um, what was going on at the time of filling out the uh, questionnaire. And also that you have to obscure the study's actual goal when measuring objective behavior, which uh, might raise some ethical concerns and that might well, will mean uh, that you have to uh, discuss these concerns and take them into account and, um, uh, yeah, well, uh, not cross any ethical lines here. There are, uh, however, also many advantages, uh, such as that you can reach a large group of respondents, gaining large uh, re uh, power, statistical power, and this group can be re representative, and that you're also able to do objective measurements. So we feel that this type of research is an opportunity for future researchers into cybersecurity, online behavior, and online victimization. I would like to thank you for your attention and time. And if you do have any questions concerning this uh, study, please feel free to contact me and uh, have a good day.